This is Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom Podcast. We enthuse, we energize, we inspire, and we empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes in BW and beyond. Let me welcome you to dear viewer and listener to another episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom Podcast. I'm thrilled as you can see and I'm excited to welcome yet another entrepreneur Taboho uh, Mohali Emang. He'll introduce himself in greater detail. But as always, Bahaitsu, please hit that strike, uh, sub, uh, subscribe button, strike it along with the notification bell. But let me make a shameless plug also for my book, Mump Nuggets of Grit from the Kettle Post to Serial Entrepreneurship. This is a beautiful book. I spent two, more than two years writing this book with Saidi Ndala. We talk about servant leadership. We talk about how the Lord has blessed us to create um, the business uh, enterprise that we've created. And we, we, we urge that you do the same. We talk about avid readership. So many things you can read here um, and, and learn about. It's only three ninety nine For you to get the book, you just have to call my PA on uh, 397-1368. 3971368. Thank you so much. Welcome to the studio, Tabo Mahalema. Ah, thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you for having me. <laughs> what brings you here? How did you know about us? <laughs> um, I I doubt there is anyone who's on LinkedIn, who's online, who hasn't seen snippets of what you do. Mm. Uh, but for me being from the local entrepreneurship ecosystem mm. i've seen you in multiple platforms before okay yes sir. Uh, that's wonderful could you share your uh, your background as you introduce yourself to the people all right um i'm an engineer by training um i graduated with a masters of engineering in electronics uh, specializing in telecommunications from the University of Southampton in UK back in 2008. Mm. So I have over 15 years of professional experience as an engineer. Mm -hmm. And for me really, engineering is all about creative problem solving. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that problem solving part that has also now led me to monetizing from solving problems as an engineer. Mm. Yes, sir. But um, therefore, things that I bring as a person wherever I go. It's the entrepreneurship side of things, but it's also the ecosystem building side of things. Um, when I started what I do back then, it was a lonely place here. <laughs> the, the entrepreneurship wasn't a cool thing. Actually, of all the people that I graduated with back in the days, I'm the only one who quit my job after three years or so <laughs> to say I want to do something else. This corporate world is not for me. Yes, sir. So there is the ecosystem building part where mm. it's like entrepreneurs thrive when they have a supporting community. So then by naturally, I found myself becoming an ecosystem builder. Mm. Then the other thing is I love transformation. Uh, as an en engineer, naturally, whenever we find inefficiencies, we want to understand the structure that is generating these inefficiencies so that <coughs> we could find solutions or exploit opportunities of finding solutions and creating opportunities from these. So mm. I bring entrepreneurship, I build ecosystem building, I bring systems transformation, but most importantly, I bring learning wherever I go. I believe that in the power of lifelong learning mm -hmm. and learning not in the context of school, mm -hmm. learning as in continuously building our capacity to achieve our highest aspirations. Wow, that is so powerful. Let me take you back to how it all started in terms of the what sparked interest in engineering. Um, engineering is, is creativity, isn't it? And so, so, uh, indeed, so, sir. So what, what really sparked uh, your interest initially? I think breaking things apart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, was, I was one of those kids. I, I loved opening things wow. up. I, 
I would open something and then fail to put it back together. <laughs> Always have <laughs> screws where you don't know where it came from. Mm. But I think for me, really, um, you know, when you're doing very well in school from a young age, you have teachers who are supportive. And I'll never forget the encouragement I got from one of my elite teachers, mm. um, Mr. Powder from back then, junior school mm -hmm. when i was doing form one he put me in the math and science team mm -hmm. i was doing that with uh, more senior guys from two students so i got exposed from a very mm -hmm. young age to problems that were beyond my level mm -hmm. so and in so doing i got to meet people who you know who showed me there was more mm -hmm. to what i was previously exposed so to the world so from then on i met guys when i was young who showed me back in the days back in the late 90s yeah. and the early 2000s the internet i'll never forget the first time i <laughs> I, I saw somebody going online yeah. back when we had those just from the way you're smiling <coughs> it must have been a beautiful experience uh, it, it was mesmerizing and i got that opportunity to job shadow a team of engineers mm -hmm. and they were taking me to the meetings project meetings and i was young back then so from then on i think i was like yeah Mm. I, I want to be like this man. Mm. I want to get into meetings, listen to people talking about not I just guess. problems, mm. but solving these problems and then applying themselves to solve these problems. Mm. I think from then on, you know, being good in math and science, mm. naturally everyone is like, you have to think about engineering, you have to think about medicine. But it was really now when I was overseas, for my engineering studies when I when it actually the University of Southampton at the University of Southampton when it clicked clicked mm. because there we were being taught things to, to build this mm. I studied all the electronics all the maths mm. and all the coding for building this mm. and getting the mobile phone to connect to the tower we wow. did the maths so the math is quite important just before they came to africa yeah no no uh, just were, around okay. yeah just around no they were new in africa they were then. new in africa mm. the mobile networks came yeah, it's, when i was doing it's zero 08 not 98 eh? yes zero eight, when so i was doing form two mm. i remember our teacher had the biggest mobile phone <laughs> <laughs> we call them bricks <laughs> bricks the, yeah. the side gem ones and uh. all that but for me it actually clicked when I was a student and I was seeing how our lecturers were not talking about tech from the context tech context of gadgets. Yeah. They I saw that they started with a problem. Mm -hmm. And then they invested time doing research to understand this problem. And then technology was a tool mm -hmm. for solving this problem. I think that really changed my mindset mm -hmm. and it got me to become a lover of problems. <laughs> well, so even when I'm talking to people, I ask a lot of why, why, mm -hmm. why? Because I, I believe understanding problems, spending yeah. time understanding problems. Let, let me interrupt you there and ask you specifically about those three years you mentioned that you are one of those guys who worked for three years yes where did you work and what was your first uh first job all right on the corporate side of things i only worked for mascom mm. i was a core network engineer mm. uh, that basically just means when you send a message or when you call um the call has to be routed to the person you are calling, mm -hmm. uh, the system behind all that that does that in telecommunications, we call it the core network, mm -hmm. where we do the switching, where we manage the traffic and all that. So that was my role back then. I, I was fresh from school. I had done research in the space and Mascom and Orange back then, they were introducing mobile broadband uh, flybox was relatively new back then and mascom had also introduced a similar network so mm. i had an opportunity to apply myself on another role that mascom gave me mm -hmm. um i was i also got on to become 
a YMX engineer. So what YMX was a new technology. What is YMX? <laughs> it's the technology that was powering Flybox. Uh -huh. The technical name oh, yeah, for the technology. Yes, yeah. yes. It was YMX. I remember those days <coughs> even when we had problems with our with our cell phones or SIM cards or whatever, we'd go and sit and wait for some engineers to fix that and there. Yes. Yeah. So remember Flybox when it came out, they gave, it was the first network that also gave you like a router, a yes. mobile router yes. that wasn't connected I to an internet. That. I remember yes. clearly. So that was mobile broadband. Mm. But uh, for me, the, the second role was re the one that really shaped me. Mm. I, I, I had the creative freedom to track the network because it didn't have live subscribers to test my ideas and then to put those ideas on a system mm. and see things work. Wow. And okay. I, I was doing that from end to end. So by the time I finished... For the, those three years. For those three years. Mm. For one and a half years, actually, mm. because the other one, in one year I was on the core network role and then I transferred to the YMX side of things. Okay. Then for close to two years, that was mm. my role. Mm. So when you're working on a project and you are curious enough, mm. you don't consider that you have a job description. <laughs> you, you do what has to be done yes. to test your assumptions and to learn. Yes. So once I completed the project and it was working as desired, then it became about business as usual, routine stuff. Mm. And I think for me that's what uh, kind of also drove me out mm. because things were starting to become monotonous mm. and repetitive and I, I, the edge, the, 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 the challenge to do more was no longer there because now the system was live. Mm -hmm. So that's when now, you know, I wanted opportunities to solve problems. Mm. I, you become a nuisance when you are thinking like that mm -hmm. because when you pick a problem, you ask, why are we not doing this? Mm. Why, why, why can't we do that? Just from your personality, it seems to me you are the kind of guy who loves problems, who actually enjoys tackling problems. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I just think you are that kind of guy. Am I, I right? You are, sir. Like I said, I was trained from that philosophy of engineering mm. that take time to understand the problem because opportunities come from problems. Mm. So for me, when it's when you, I believe it's when we are not coming with preconceived notions mm -hmm. of what the solution has to be when we are challenged beyond our current knowledge base that we start synthesizing mm -hmm. that we start being creative because now we're exploring the unknown and for me that's that's where my love for problems comes from yeah, yeah. because they they fuel my natural curiosity and creativity mm. and then uh, the company spectrum analytics yes sir what the, does the name come from and and uh, tell us the process of of, of, of uh, cre its creation yes so let me continue the story so once i left mascom mm. i didn't know what i wanted to do but i knew that i didn't want to continue in what i was doing mm. so i remember when i was leaving people were giving me advice well, where are you going i was like i don't know really but, but I'll, I'll rather be out there and trying to figure that out than to be here and you know stifled stifled by by, by the environment yes, yes. Mm. so after i left i i had a couple of opportunities to do phd in mathematical optimization and computer science whatever that means yes mm. um, actually um, with mathematical optimization it's easy Every problem is an optimization problem. Mm. You want to maximize something or mm. minimize some pain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what optimization is all yeah, about. Yeah. But <coughs> you have limited resources. Now the challenge, the general challenge there is mm. given my objective, either to maximize this or minimize this, and the limited resources that I have, it could be money, it could be time, it could be people, how do I get the best of out of what I have? Mm -hmm. A solution to that challenge, it's highly mathematical all the time, even in project management, 
for your optimization, how you lay down things on a chip, how you schedule your shifts. Mm. All that, those problems can be reduced to mathematics mm -hmm. and be solved efficiently. So I had an opportunity to study that after I left MassCom. But something told me that I was getting more deeper into the theoretical side of things because mathematics is just a tool. It's, to me, it's not a subject. It's mm. a, a problem-solving toolbox. Mm -hmm. So I was like, but where are the problems that I want to solve? So first problem that I picked was around then. Back so you then, turned down the opportunity. I turned down the opportunities, mm. both by Bust, by the way. So I have uh, two scholarships from Bust. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I, I to do a PhD. To do PhDs. Yes. Yes, sir. Two PhDs. Two PhDs. I could have done. Okay. The, mm. one, the other one came years later after I turned the first one. But mm. yeah, the same organization offered me mm. two opportunities for that. Mm. But around then, I was bothered by this issue of sisting me down wherever I was going. <laughs> you you try to get a Banks, service. government, any, everywhere. Sisting me down. It's mm. like, what is, the, what is driving this mm. and making this a common problem everywhere for us? So I then became really possessed by mm. that problem. <laughs> <laughs> you say possessed, you're not saying obsessed. It means it was far more serious. Yes, then mm. I started realizing that, oh, no, it's the way we work. We are not structured in our work. We don't document processes. So when I come in and I get assisted by one person from the same organization, I get a different experience today. Tomorrow it's a different person. I get a different experience. Mm. So it's like, no, but if it's the same organization, the value creating process has to give me consistent experience. Mm -hmm. So then it started me with... Um, processes, understanding processes, how do we optimize the activities and steps around value creation itself? Mm. See, that's the optimization part coming in around processes. Mm. So over the years, I just spend a lot of time asking questions, people in government, to understand why our systems were always down. Mm. Then it boiled to decision making. I realized we were making ad hoc decisions. So if I was the highest ranking person in the organization, my voice would be heavier than the next person's. Even if my idea is not necessarily the best. Mm. <laughs> so then I was like, but how do I show people that these are the, these are the things that we are doing that are making these problems that we are facing inevitable, which is how do we create a single source of truth to allow us to, to have informed conversation mm -hmm. where perspectives, where ideas are not evaluated based on hierarchy mm -hmm. within the organization, but rather on their merit. And that's mm -hmm. when I discovered data, mm -hmm. that if I can get data and then show what the data is showing. So you want to promote data-driven decision-making? Yes, sir. Mm. Back then, that's where it started. Mm. So that's where the analytics part of the country, the company comes from. The name mm. Spectrum Analytics, mm. that analytics part mm -hmm. was born from create the methods that we use mm. to get value from data. They are all called analytics. Mm -hmm. The Spectrum part of it, came because I realized hmm, which industries are really thriving from this? All of them. So it's a spectrum kind of coverage. Oh, it's got a wide spectrum. <laughs> it, it's got a wide spectrum in terms of relevance. Mm -hmm. So you can say as early as 2004-05. Is that when you started the company? The, 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 the idea itself. Mm -hmm. So when I started, the first company I founded was called Spectrum Consultants. Mm -hmm. But then I realized when you're starting calling yourself a consultant is a career killer. Why? <laughs> Because consultants are notorious for talking and using buzzwords, yeah. jargon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you call a consultant here, they'll speak jargon. You think you understand each other, but you're not having... <laughs> <laughs> 
a conversation. They are hiding behind jargon most of the times. Yeah. But back then, people would say, but you are a one-man company. Mm. How can you be a group of consultants? Mm. But I wanted to bring the analytics side mm. of things. So Spectrum Analytics itself was born way back as an idea. Mm -hmm. But it was formally registered in 2017 now. So after I left Mascom and running out of money, I was like, I need to end something here. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I've turned down a uh, scholarship. Uh, I now need to end. So I started going to companies to help them with the issue around the system being mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. And then showed them this is a process issue. This is a culture issue. And technology is just an enabler. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into this how space. How did you survive those early days? Most, uh, most young entrepreneurs describe those early days as a bit of a nightmare. The, six, the first six to 12 months. And then, in fact, the first three years. <coughs> Surprisingly, back then, when I was a one-man company, because I was doing that to, it was a hand-to-mouth kind of thing. Mm. So uh, I, I was doing slightly better, <laughs> because then, uh, I was only looking at myself. So I could <laughs> get a gig that would pay me well. Mm. And then I, I was prudent. Mm. I would invest in my education. I would do courses online just to understand back then artificial intelligence wasn't wasn't even a it wasn't even a word <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. uh, back then we were talking early ages of talking about machine learning mm -hmm. and i i learned that as early back as in your 2005s mm. most people actually now who are talking about artificial intelligence are just talking about machine learning which mm. is just a subset of ai mm. so how i survived i'll go to companies i'll tell them i see you have this problem let me come in solve it for you if there are improvements can you promise to pay me so much yeah so because i was a one-man company i would spend six months on a project they'll see early results they'll pay me mm. but then along the way i realized ah this is not sustainable give an example of what kind of problems yes so one company that I assisted, they were having challenges with um, automating their processes. So it would take the employees about a week for them to capture names on some old system. Someone would take the, the, the customers would be your banks, your mm -hmm. insurances, they would send them information on a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. They would print the spreadsheet go sit in front of a computer type the details one by one line by line yeah that was every tedious. month mm. and that introduced human errors because if that's a five and i squint and mm. it looks like an eight yeah. that's someone's id id captured wrong mm. so i came in and they were telling me build us a system please it's like uh it's not a system let me come in and assess take time to understand this problem mm. and then i found that it was the process and the system so i i would come in do a system audit and then from the system i would be like what kind of system would you need to have to solve this problem mm -hmm. what should inform that is the processes how people are working so i'll then create a specification from a system from the process requirements, the mm. business requirements. Mm -hmm. So I flipped the script back then. Wow. And that's for, that for me allowed me to add value immediately, mm -hmm. allowed me to get the references because I would sometimes just get a call. Hey, so and so, so said. Why, why do you say it's not sustainable? <coughs> um, it, I couldn't scale, like I had to physically be there. Mm -hmm. And also when I tried to bring people, they didn't have my background, mm -hmm. which mean which meant I had to hire more people and teach them, which would take more time. Mm -hmm. And I realized I could also automate some of what I was doing manually for them, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is when now I thought I, I could do this differently. I could do this sustainably mm -hmm. by automating more, getting a team to assist me. So Spectrum Analytics was born from, let me get a team 
and explore these opportunities mm. because I was I was seeing back then that everyone was having similar challenges. Mm. Wow, this is very very interesting. Now, um, any other setbacks or challenges that you encountered uh, in your business since you've established? Yes, sir. Mm. Um, it's it takes it takes time when in our environment first. Mm to just find the right support. You can't be an entrepreneur in a, it's not a solo game. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a network game. Um, you start, you are obsessed with, you love the problem, mm. but there is more to making what you are doing a business that is beyond just your technical capability. Mm -hmm. So I, in the early days, uh, as I mentioned, I I needed to learn more about how businesses work. I needed to network. I needed to be connected to even more people that I could uh, derive value for. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> and the hardest problem for me has been building a team uh, people think differently. People have different motivations. Mm -hmm. You bring people who think like you. You skew in the process. Diversity wins. But for me, it's it's also in now when you want to scale. I, I hear younger people thinking funding is the most important part. But I think demonstrating the value of wha what you are bringing to the table, that value, mm. and getting market access opportunities to show some... It's more important it's than It's more funding. important than funding for me. Mm -hmm. Because if one person can give me an opportunity to show them I can deliver this, then I can use them as a reference mm -hmm. so that more people can then see I've created value for so, so and so. That means you you bootstrapped your business I've, for the most time. I've bootstrapped but my business to date. Yeah, tell us about the advantages of that because that's a part that most young people find difficult to conceptualize. Yes. So we, you know, we talk about a knowledge economy, for example, mm. but nobody's funding knowledge-driven businesses. That, that <laughs> is, is another sort of challenge because knowledge is not, is not commoditized mm. really uh, in our ecosystem. So as a challenge there, you'd find that it takes a longer time because the, you identify an opportunity, but you don't have the resources to to pull together a team mm. and quickly exploit the opportunity. Mm. Um, from when I started, things have improved. Now we have your BDIH offering through our facilities like Botswana Innovation Fund. They have also been instrumental in training some of us. Mm. Yes, things may not have been perfect, but <coughs> they've really allowed a generation of entrepreneurs <coughs> to take the first step, mm. understand just how to create a business. But bootstrapping itself, it's painful. Mm. It's anxiety inducing, <laughs> especially. <laughs> <laughs> I love because I've been there, done that. Yeah. Especially at the end of the month, mm. uh, the long payment cycles. Mm. Uh, we have really had enterprises, big enterprises that have taken a year to, to mm. settle that invoices and if you are sometimes I wonder whether they have nefarious <laughs> motives you know sometimes I wonder yes it, it's it's difficult to explain because if I've rendered services and everything is settled you should have processes for just settling that immediately mm. you should have processes for settling that immediately but it's it takes time mm. um sometimes you 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 do those follow-ups when your own employees sometimes unpaid and you understand they have responsibilities and you see that they have loyalty mm. but loyalty cannot pay <laughs> <laughs> it helps but it can, yeah. yes it, it doesn't pay so, so 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 what specific setbacks did you encounter all right when i look at when I started the business and just how much the, the, the cost of opportunity of doing what I'm 
doing now mm. had i stuck to my work <laughs> i would be um a, a high-ranking uh person within the corporate structure of a senior engineer maybe an engineering manager mm. so the cost of opportunity has been high but it took time for tech businesses to make sense to us mm. actually to COVID 19 for people to experience d disruptions and see opportunities for digital technologies for them to have business uh, continuity. Mm. You now can go to the office and the system that you were using was installed only in the office. You want your employees to work you from have the home. same thing at home. Yes, you want people to create together from wherever they are. Mm -hmm. And now people post COVID, that's when things accelerated and even improved for us. Mm -hmm. But think when I left Mascom back in 2013 mm -hmm. and up to now, we've been showing people demonstrating this can work, but that they were not having enough pain. The pains were not deeper. So in that sense, sense, COVID was more of a an blessing than a curse for you. Indeed, sir. Indeed, you can say that. Because for me, some of the challenges that we were aware of got magnified by COVID-19. And you know, the reset <laughs> word. Agenda, yeah. Agenda became popular after. Mm. So now you are not coming in to confront people when you said you can work better. Mm -hmm. They were now they were, receptive. they were receptive because they were already aware because they were experiencing that as a pain point they mm. could relate with. Mm. So the the sale was now much easier. Mm. People would say, "Hey, I want to do this. I want my people to do that," and immediately you connect. Would you say this this uh, happened across the board for all, shall we say, tech enabled companies? Yes, so all companies are increasingly becoming technology driven mm -hmm. and when you are technology driven you are forced to invest in technology. Now, are you going to become an IT company on top of your core business <laughs> or are you going to focus on your core business and allow someone to take care mm -hmm. of the IT side of things? Mm -hmm. So everyone is being disrupted by technology it's just a matter of appetite of where they do they want to take the responsibility for building the tech mm. for becoming more technology driven becoming an IT company mm. or they want to outsource that to guys like us to take care of that mm. while they focus on what they know best and we focus on what we know best as well what would you say are some of your significant successes or triumphs all right um, I would say for me, my biggest success was when I figured out the kind of entrepreneur I wanted to become. Because that then made things easy for me. I made a conscious decision to become a purpose-driven entrepreneur. Then that allowed me to orient resources that I had to build values that I wanted to bring to this business and for me to build a team that embraced these values. And now finally having a team, I have a team of uh, 13 employees now. Mm -hmm. And these guys nowadays, they can work even when I'm gone for a few weeks mm. because now there are values and a culture, a way of working that we have shared and you know invest that time for our people to understand how which we then leads work. me to the question then your purpose driven what then is your purpose all right as an engineer i think my purpose really i'm more driven by leveraging te imaging technologies and specifically and data for social impact uh for me i i would love to see the work that i do improve other people's lives so i i've seen technology being abused um when we were back when i was still a student the royal 
force, like the, the British Army. Mm -hmm. They trained their engineers at our university. And then during career affairs, your leading weapons manufacturing companies would come to recruit mm. engineers from my university. Mm. And then my course itself, telecommunication, uh, it's a militarized degree. Mm. Almost all the advanced uh, applications of my course are military based. Most advanced of them are. Well, there are those who would argue on that you need that for self defense. Indeed. And it, it's not just. All the personal technologies that we enjoy mm. emerge from applications that span off the militarized side of things. Yeah, I'm told even GPS. Yes, even your, your, your Bluetooth. All uh, those were known by the military for years. For years, for yeah. years. Mm. So when I was in school, I started seeing the dark side of... <laughs> of what you do. Of what I do. Then yeah. I asked myself, do I want to use my knowledge and... Expertise. Expertise to perpetuate human suffering? Mm -hmm. And that's when, for me now, I was like, no, it, it can, it can there be a different path? Mm -hmm. And what would it take to do that? It's like, okay, let me take the path and I'll discover that along the way. Mm -hmm. And that's when my, my purpose came from. But there's also another thing from my background that really motivated me to go down this path. Mm -hmm. So I was... I grew up in Old Naledi, that's the most disadvantaged community in the city. Mm -hmm. And when I was a student, you know, you told someone you live in Old Naledi immediately. It's like... Mm -hmm. They know, think they're in danger. They think they're in danger. Mm -hmm. But for me, because I was always the top student in all my classes, how did you manage that? I think we can just pause there. We'll get back to it. <laughs> because it's normally disadvantaged, so-called disadvantaged children perform poorly. How did you reverse the script? All right. I think for me, it started with being able to read quite from a very young age. So I used to cry to go to school with my older sister. Mm. And she would come back from school and she would teach me what she learned. Mm -hmm. So then I, from a young age, I just started reading books that she was bringing. Mm. So I could get lost in the world of books. So mm -hmm. I saw a different world from a young age through books that showed me different ways of doing things than what my environment was Validating. Yes, yeah. So I think for me that and the belief that my teachers always had. Mm. Remember when we were doing standard three and we the first comp one of the first compositions was what do I wanna be when I grow when I grow up? So I wrote that I wanted to be a scientist. You wrote that? Yes. Mm. And my, my teacher was so impressed and she's like, Yes, you can do it. Mm. And that's another thing with older people believing in you it gives you validation it gives you validation it shows you you can be more mm. so i never truly saw my background as a setback mm. but i just saw it more like a setup that also mm. in a way you know there was a bit of an ego trip there yeah because yeah. i could be there and say yeah maybe it's staying in old lady but look mm. I'm, I'm the best student in school it's like me and kettle post uh, indeed it's yeah. of, uh, it, it, it's it pride. was it was mm. your setup mm. so in in life we all have uh, a setup mm. that we then need to build off we all start somewhere mm. so but to your question mm. i saw how for other students who were struggling, the teachers were knocking them down and even instilling a crippling mindset that, yes, mm. you know, you are, you are performing as expected because you are from old lady. Mm. What more could you be? Mm -hmm. So, and then the students believe that mm. and then they don't apply themselves because mm. they think that setup is the best they can be. That's terrible. A and in a lot of ways, that's what for a lot of us, our setup has been encouraging. Mm. I, I was only exposed to this, so the only reality for me would be 
exactly yeah. that yeah. yes so how much taka go botsa ka tswanahela gore um ke eng se se go gwetlang ke eng se se as ka ka se be what turns you on but what is that because i'm still going to that purpose driven thing yes a go leke go itlhalosa re tlhalogane yes sir ka se ga rona ke tle ke question era so when i when you look at all the guys who have made lots of money in the world mm. what do they do in their latter years once they've retired some of them don't even retire but they become chairman of the board or something yes but if you <coughs> let's take bill gates philanthropy yes mm. what is that giving them purpose mm-hmm. so there is a there is so much early on that you you get back as like satisfaction mm. from dominating others mm-hmm. to get where you want to get but then again you reach a stage where you want more you you want meaning out of life i think it's human nature to seek meaning and for me purpose mm. knowing that you want something that is higher than what you you think is possible like mm. you are not just working for the benefit of you as an individual mm. but you are you want greater good for the greater community for the greater community mm. because that's what all those philanthropists are doing mm-hmm. they are no longer solving their individual problems but they are now addressing challenges around them they have yeah. the resources but now to for their lives to have meaning at that point they are now investing mm. in solving problems there and there in the development is that why some world. of them pledge to give away everything when they die indeed i uh, even you take warren buffett for example he mm. donated all his money to bill gates for bill gates to mm. solve problems that he was focusing on mm. so i think for me then i saw that ah, but this thing one can turn it into i don't need mm. to make money first mm. to start having purpose can't i have purpose and make money mm-hmm. so i I I tend to love creating challenges. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For 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 myself to say because mm. for me it's about trying things out. So are you involved in any form of philanthropy or church activity or that sort of purpose beyond work? Yes, sir. So I'll go back to one part of what I started with ecosystem building. Mm. So I realized, "Oh, wait. I have the skills there are younger people who graduate from university and they haven't been exposed to these tools to these things that I already know mm. so i started teaching students uh data analysis skills exposing them to tools that could be used for analytics at no pay almost once a month i would host meetups we call them meetups we host tutorials mm. so i've been doing a lot of work with developer communities mm. uh teaching mainly students young professionals which then got into me like working with mm. universities and through linkages with uh boost for example um twice to date uh we hosted a machine learning boot camp as far back as 2008 mm. we called lecturers we called prof- researchers and we trained them oh on using practical tools for data analysis wow so for me i i, I love training trainers people who then go and work directly with students now mm-hmm. so i realized working directly with students didn't have that much impact mm. so i then went and trained the trainers, the trainers. Mm. and that has changed the local landscape back when we started in wow. doing this uh, in 2017 18 there wasn't a single university teaching machine learning in the country or using open source tools mm-hmm. now almost all of them use them including the It, the the, 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 the <coughs> private ones like yes mm. so i would say and uh, some of the lecturers we trained at our first boot camp went and used the same tools and taught them to their students mm. so I've, i've without boasting or anything i've really transformed the the local data analysis space since wow. 
And for me, that's that's what purpose does. Wow. Wow. And wow. <laughs> wow. That's a lot to be very happy about. It's, it's really significant. I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Now, I want us to pivot a little bit to talk specifically about artificial intelligence. Yes, sir. Uh, it was only at the end of uh, last year, I think around November. Yes, sir. When um, AI was made accessible to the public. Um, in terms of usage, and now even here, I mean, I taught my, I learned about how to use it. And my secretary learned recently. I taught her. Could you speak to how it's impacting us and its importance to society? Yes. So AI is really just about crunching lots of data, the shortest amount of time and then synthesizing of those insights. Basically, that's just what you're doing. Mm. So if you are to take the amount of data and try to process it as a human being, to take us, yes, <laughs> you can get tired mm. <laughs> because it's, it's, it's data intensive. Mm. But a computer is quite good at just crunching Numbers. Numbers. Mm. And then... A and words. And words <laughs> now. And words now. And a computer is also very good at recognizing patterns. Right now, a com if you were to... There are some conditions when if one has diabetes, you know, you can take a picture, uh, r radio imaging of your eyes, eyes Mm. And uh, a medical doctor would then look at that to identify certain defects mm. that could point towards blindness induced by diabetes. Mm -hmm. Computer can perform that better than doctors now, mm -hmm. analyzing images better than doctors mm -hmm. for many conditions. Mm. So AI in that sense allows us mm. to make sense out of lots of data. And now we all always generating data. The amount of data that human beings are generating now, just in the last two years, we have generated more data than in the entire human history. Mm. And I read somewhere that it doubles every six months. It doubles now and then. Mm. So there is data. There is a need to derive insights from data. And what's the best tool for that? It's AI. Mm. So now, understanding that where those repetitive tasks that don't require much brain application. Yes, where it's just analyzing this repeatedly. Mm. Those are areas where AI is offering opportunities or rather is threatening <laughs> to replace human mm. interventions. And in, in that, in, in that well, context... Humans will always have to interpret that data. Yes. Isn't it? Or to apply it. To apply it. But an AI can analyze the data and recommend the best mm. path mm. faster than a human being can and sometimes even more accurately. So if you are on, in a process where you need to... But data doesn't have compassion, doesn't have certain emotions. Indeed. Which but may be relevant to decision making. But that's another thing. Are humans good at that? The ethical side of things. Are humans good at that? Well, we'd like to believe <laughs> they are. Yeah, we'd no. like to they are better than machines. No, I... I, I we can I, have a debate about that. You don't think that we are good at that? No. Um, um, I, I think we have reached a, a very interesting point in human evolution where we've given on ourselves for upholding ethics and human values mm. and we want to outsource those to machines mm -hmm. so now most of the concerns that we have about ai around ethics are you be like but those biases are there in human societies mm -hmm. we're not talking about those biases at human level but we want ai mm. <laughs> to do what we are failing to do mm. uh, it's not for me to discount the dangers of ai there are quite a lot of them our addiction to devices is driven by AI. Mm. 
Mm. Um, because they've analyzed everything. They, they yes. They, they they analyze us as we are using this device. Yes, how when you use it, mm. and they start making recommendations, sending mm. you content mm. that is related to what you most likely mm. serve. I mean, their ultimate objective is just to have us glued nonstop. Yes. To the device. So they they're the biggest um, commodity of our age is attention. I agree. It's attention. I agree. And these things <laughs> are able to grab mm. our attention more than anything else. Mm. And that ability to just play with our attention, AI is very good at it. Mm. They can recognize when you are getting bored. Mm. Do you remember the first generation of uh, Facebook applications? We actually had to know someone for the things to pop in your timeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen someone just not knowing what they are looking for, mm. but just continuously just I've scrolling? I've seen it. I've seen it. It affects productivity. Yes. Mm. But you know that part is a lesson that AI has optimized from gambling. Mm -hmm. So if, I, if I'm addicted to gambling and you give me coins, a bucketless coin, what am I going to do? And I'm on at the slot machine. Mm. I'm just gonna put my hand continuously put in there continuously, mm. and that's what we're doing when we are just mm -hmm. scrolling. We want that that rush, that rush, that fix. Mm. Now, when you hear ding, mm. you 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 are your brain is rewarded with a feel good mm. <laughs> rush, mm. and it's because they made they call it. Them what endorphins? Yes. And you sar uh, sar serotonin, something like that. Yes, so it, the, the feel good mm. hormones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you you are oxytocin. You yeah, get oxytocin. rewarded for, for achieving oxytocin. nothing. Oxytocin. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. what is that also now doing? Mm. It means we cannot sustain actions that require us to focus for a longer time, mm. because we have w short reward circuits in our brain. Mm. So those are some of the. The, the, the dangers about maybe that's why some companies are suggesting employees should be paid weekly instead of monthly. <laughs> so what's coming? Yes, because because yeah, now people just that, yeah. want that. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't get that delayed gratification, mm. though that you know, mm. builds greed. We mm. no longer have people with greed. No, talking about my book now, eh? <laughs> nuggets of greed. Yeah. Yes, you can imagine if you grew up in an age where you were easily distracted and you couldn't focus. Mm. And that is one side of AI that we're not talking about. What's it doing to uh, Gen X's, Xers and Millennials and, and these young ones? What is it doing to their mindset long term? And the in the long term, from what I've seen, um, um, I build a company around young people. I I normally just I'm wild. Mm. You can never guy walking around the office not even looking where they are going, mm. just deeply engrossed. Yeah. I've realized whenever we are anywhere, if one person was to pick their phone everyone picks their phone. Mm. So for me, it's the human interactions. <laughs> it has changed how people interact. Mm. So now I can be with people instead of connecting with them, learning from them, appreciating them. I'm connecting. This thing is giving me an illusion of a connection with someone who is elsewhere or and people, equally yeah. distracted and not living in the moment. Mm. So it's not it's not real. It's not <laughs> real connection, mm. but these technologies are making us feel like we are connecting. Mm. And um, I think for me, it's is the human relations. Mm -hmm. Beyond the human relations is where we place value in work. Mm. It's changing how we work. People want to work from home, mm. but how do you build a connected culture? How do you build trust? Mm. How do you build? How do you create together yeah. when you are not talking to each good other? Good question. Now, what exactly is Spectrum Analytics doing, or how are they web, well, not weaponizing, utilizing AI to help their clients? How is your company actually? What What are you doing on an average day or an average week to All assist right. your customers? All right. So, it it comes back to data. Mm. Everyone, 
all enterprises have lots of data. Mm. How many of them are creating value from data? Very few. Very few. And that's where we come in. Um, our mission really is quite simple, to enable enterprises to create value from data. Mm. So we looked back at hurdles that companies face when they want to become data driven. Mm. And for us, it's about where you are storing the data, infrastructure, your servers, your st that. And also now it's also now data is the biggest driver of value. So in the digital economy, data is a mineral. Mm -hmm. Which has to be mined. Yes. So it has to be mined. Mm. It has to be protected. It has to be managed. It may not appear in your financial books. It should. But it should. Mm. Because that's the primary driver of value in the digital economy. Uh, they say who, he who has data is the king. So can you come into an organization and 10x it just through through targeted data yeah. and arranging data in a certain so, way? Yes, sir. So that calls for increasing the organization's capacity to create value from data. So for us, we help them address infrastructure challenges. So maybe you are using old technologies that you can't integrate together because the richer, the more data you can mm. bring together, the more things you can see. Mm. And then the, on the other side, it's data management. How do you protect your data? Now people can come in, ransomware acts. Ransom? Uh, ransomware. Mm. So you know when you are being held at ransom. Yeah, yeah. So someone can get into your systems and, hack. and yeah. hack into that, and then lock your files, and then tell you, hey, for me to unlock this, pay me this much. And it's hap it has happened to a lot of mm. <laughs> big Business. enterprise businesses yeah. here, mm. because now that's the other downside of AI. AI is able to infiltrate mm. the, the, the guys who are playing bad, mm. they are leveraging technologies to become more efficient. Yeah. So <coughs> for us, we help organizations modernize their infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We help organizations... Can it really be up to date? Because it was six months later, it's, it's yes. obsolete. Yes. It keeps going obsolete. Yes. We help them migrate to the cloud. Mm -hmm. We help them lower cloud costs. Mm -hmm. We help them automate the management of their data infrastructure or their data systems. Mm -hmm. uh, because you would have some of your data on the cloud, some of it on premises mm. and then you have to use different tools for managing this data so for us mm. that's where we apply ai mm -hmm. to simplify infrastructure management help you get the best out of your infrastructure and then make sure that you are able to protect your data move it securely and get it to people who needed to make decisions. It's not an expensive proposition doing all this. It is. Uh, this is why for us, our targets, we do enterprise innovation. We don't innovate for the individual. We innovate for enterprises mm. and we are targeting mining, uh, financial sector, banks, insurances, mm. and telcos. property companies like us? If you have lots of data, you, you fit the profile. We but a though we love a lot of uh, customers and and tenants tenants yes and for you it could just be if you were to maybe put sensors in anywhere in your process mm. maybe you want continuous observation you want to see people you want to identify objects You're talking about cameras cameras yes uh -huh. iot okay any where where there's an opportunity IOT to iot stands for Internet of Things. Internet so of things, it's, okay. it's basically it's just mm. using sensors to collect data and then make sense of mm. that data because it's doing that on a continuous basis mm -hmm. it means you are generating lots of data for that. Mm. And there are use cases for leveraging what we do mm -hmm. in any industry really. So even for you, uh, we can come in, mm. understand where you want to go, go back look at technologies that can help you get there and put data as a driver primer of like are there any recent case studies uh, which you can share 
um, without mentioning names. It's your, t- it's your chance to uh, to blow your own trumpet, <laughs> plug shamelessly. <laughs> <laughs> There are are multiple of them. Mm. Um, It can be fraud detection. Um, As people pay or swipe using the... Examples, which specific examples, without mentioning names. All right. Mm. So um, as a customer, let's say uh, there are patterns around how you pay Mm. and then you, you buy stuff. So that expen- those expenses, they form a certain profile about you, right? So we can use analytics to understand how Remohobi pays, and then you now start l- seeing, oh, I can recommend this product to Remohobi because he, he can afford that. I can recommend this product to Remohobi because he has previously said yes when i recommended this mm-hmm. so you remember like, just like when you're on netflix you watch a movie the next recommendation is similar to what you consume yeah, yeah, yeah. you can use that in financial sector but you can also use that to pick uh transactions by remo Hobe that don't fit his normal way of doing things maybe all of a sudden at 1 a.m remo Hobe's card is buying mm. things he doesn't normally buy buy in the middle of the yes, night yes yeah. that's an outlier mm. so that's a transaction that we should treat with suspicion mm. and then we flag that immediately for further investigation and sometimes automating blocking your card mm. up until we confirm with you whether hey, is it Remorobe? is it you mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. at this hour sorry to call you but yeah. is it is it you doing these transactions at this hour yeah so and that's because we're leveraging the patterns that we, maybe you've been hijacked you have been hijacked mm. indeed so it's that it's also the automation of management of infra network infrastructure mm. so before so you're saying you've done this for many clients yes sir mm. so before you before a device fails mm-hmm. if you it it shows a certain pattern mm-hmm. it's a signature a failing signature so if i'm continuously observing data i can pick the signature before this thing breaks mm-hmm. and say hey this thing is about to break. <laughs> <laughs> send someone to go fix that before it breaks yeah. because if it breaks, it's going to cost us more. We call that preventative maintenance mm-hmm. where now we don't wait for things to break before we fix mm-hmm. what is most likely to break. Wow. <laughs> the good. other side of it is what we call churn analytics. Mm-hmm. So you, I come in, I buy, and then I leave. Mm-hmm. As a, if I'm your customer, you need to understand what got me to leave. Mm. What is common with people who normally leave? How do you pick them early and then maybe offer them some discounted product mm. so that and they stay with you, it. incentivize yeah. the re, them renewing mm. contracts with you? So these are actual analytics use cases that we've wow. worked on. Wow. Wow. There's talk everywhere of mindset change. And indeed, the last two years, that's all we've been hearing um, since the president gave that major speech uh, on the issue. We've now also had the Ministry of Entrepreneurship. What's your take on all this? And um, how are you in your industry responding to the call? Yes. Like I said, I'm a problem-focused person. Mm -hmm. So for me... I looked at what has led us to remain stagnant. What has necessitated the need for us to call for a mindset change? So I took time to really understand this problem for mm. years because it was part of system me down mm. when I started. So for Is me... That what you describe when we are prepping as a wicked problem? Yes, sir. So yeah. these are complex systemic problems yeah so these are problems the word wicked yes sir <laughs> we call them wicked problems because we don't understand the dynamics behind them yeah we, we experience the negative consequences and the factors that drive them are multiple and interrelated mm-hmm. so that's where the wickedness of these problems come in mm-hmm. so i wanted to understand 
how do you solve wicked problems? <laughs> because um, we we have a, a so the need for mindset change is seen as a wicked problem or our existing mindset prior to the change that has been called for is wicked both <laughs> both okay <laughs> yes <coughs> so mindset change if we were to just declutter it whose mindset what's a mindset if we were to just declutter it mindset is a paradigm i have about the world that influences how i do things how i interact the world and how i apply myself mm -hmm. <clears throat> all right so if that is creating or perpetuating problems how did i get there where do we learn mindset so we get conditioned i'm raised in an environment that conditions me to build a certain paradigm of the world true Yes. So with that as, a, as our context, when we say we want to change the mindset, you can never directly change mindset, no matter what you do. Mm. Now, you start with the culture, how people work. You incentivize the right ways of doing things so that people start do it. This thing should be outcome driven, performance driven. Mm. We, should say, we should be saying this what are the problems that we tie to the current way we think we enumerate them mm. then we say all right what are the outcomes that we want to create we enumerate them then mm. we say all right what are the limiting beliefs and that we need to transcend because with wicked problems the the, the thing is normally it's because we are we all can't see ourselves in these problems they are always about someone else doing things differently the government doing that so and so doing that but when you actually take a step back we are also part of the problem our day-to-day -day actions create these problems as well but we are blind to how that's mm. where the wickedness comes from. Mm. So now, if we want to achieve outcomes that we want, we just need to align. Like, what do we need to do differently? Mm -hmm. And once you do things differently, you start validating the right values. You start validating the right beliefs. Mm -hmm. You start validating the right action. And the mindset then gets rewired. Mm -hmm. If you start with the mindset and defining it, you will talk forever. But where now for me? So in other words, you need to know where you are heading and what specifically are the outcomes you want. You want. Yes, it has to be outcome driven. Otherwise, it would be just talk for But when years. people just go on podiums and say, Archen Chang and Return uh, Lebo Dubai, Return Lebo Singapore. Um, it's not enough. Uh, it, it's, it's not enough. Yes, yeah. it would get us excited and then we'll get deflated because what promotes change is different outcomes mm. it's never anything else once people see different outcomes from doing things different let's give an example like our inability to delay gratification yes sir and our poor saving culture yes sir and heavy indebtedness yes sir. those are three wicked problems yes how do we tackle them all right so first for let, let's pick one Mm. Let's pick one. Which one would you like us to explore? No, pick whichever one you want. All right. So let, let me pick my favorite problem. Mm. That is quite wicked. Mm. Every year students write exams. And every year we complain about poor results. For how many years? <laughs> Lots count. <laughs> 15, 20 years. For many years. Mm. This I think it started around towards the end of the time. Yes, sir. We never used to have that problem yes. before. Yes. So this is a, a repeating problem, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have a repeating problem, there is a structure behind that. Something is making this inevitable. Mm -hmm. So we, we need then to take a step back and say, okay, 
currently students attend study, but are they studying if they are failing? They are not. Yes. So I live in Maruapula, for example. Um, students would, after school, when I'm running in the neighborhood, I would see students are only exposed to things that don't help them grow. So you have the outside, the environment outside school that is not conducive to, to growth, to, to learning. To, to learning. Mm. So when students don't spend 100% of their time in school. So if you are not going to take a step back to understand this, that all the, most of the factors that influence learning itself, mm -hmm. we're just going to focus at schools. If a student is not eating well and they come to class hungry in the morning, mm. how can they concentrate? Mm. If the teacher is not incentivized enough, can they, uh, our te my teachers during my time were parents who cared about students mm. doing well. They would come after hours. Yes, to, on sports, on and, sports all and all that. All that has but stopped. As, yes, to, because teachers are not incentivized enough. Mm. So you see just this student about this problem about education performance. Mm. If we start bringing all the other things that are related to this, soon enough we get confused complexity it becomes wicked so mm. now let's say we want to sufficiently solve this students go to school to learn what is learning learning I've, I've, we've done this with students um where they the methods of learning where mm. people are self applying uh, inquiry based learning learning happens best when you are asking questions so instead of maybe a teacher sitting there dishing information and then asking students to recall it, which is pretty much what we think is education, mm. ask a question, mm. drive students to resources, go, let them go research, they come back, they have identified that by themselves and there's a sense of pride in them having done it. Mm. And then they share it with others. We, we did robotics and coding with students in primary school, junior school, and secondary school, mm. and introduced them to inquiry-based learning. Mm -hmm. So we took a group of primary school students and gave them a challenge that we had given to secondary school students. These primary school students did this faster and were more creative than the older Counterparts. counterparts. Mm. So there's something with our education system that kills creativity, creativity and curiosity mm. because it's pretty soon it becomes about route -based, what we call route-based learning, which is regurgitation of facts, yeah, yeah, yeah. where there is no self-application, you just need to remember what you read. Mm. But learning actually happens when you are now it's connecting ideas and mm. doing that so we could change just one thing mm. how students interact with the material mm. and how they apply themselves and we could see significant improvements and then we can do sort you think out that do you think that um, talking to people at the ministry of uh, basic education and maybe targeting your teaching of these ideas to permanent secretaries and deputy permanent secretaries, would that have a cascading effect eventually? I don't know why this has not really become part of like our basic education. Mm. Uh, we've shown how this really works with BUST. I've done a lot of work with BUST in this space mm. and we have trained the trainers, the teachers themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, for me, that's how you have impact. Mm. And seen and you're saying it's beginning to have impact, that one. Uh, yes, it, we have seen results uh, in, in, in maybe not in a curriculum sense. Mm. Because with the curriculum, remember that that, well, that setup would require the teacher 
to mm. change their mindset about their role mm -hmm. inside the classroom. Yeah. Instead of this authoritative mindset where I'm the source of the knowledge, mm. you become a learner as a teacher. Mm. Mm. Then teach students learn a different rate. Yes. You then yes. need to accommodate that. Mm -hmm. And that is where maybe now, if we could show all the related factors, because wow. uh, we, we need to bring Mm. all the other factors that are creating this problem mm. to the picture and show how by aligning mm -hmm. on a shared vision we really could harness our collective intelligence to create yeah. better solutions to continuously learn mm -hmm. how we could be solving this i mean to fail for students to be failing for 15 years and we are not learning how to solve this and yet we have brainy people like yes. you who are there. It shows we are not a learning. We don't have a learning culture. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a learning culture, you stagnate. Yeah, as a community. As a community, and that is when we talk about mindset change. I wish we could discuss things like this. How mm. many projects, Ramoko, do you know? Have you had failing in Botswana? So many. Why are we not? People take mobilization yeah. and go and yeah. Why, why don't? Why are we not expect uh, in this country in project management because failure teaches you more than your success. Mm. So instead of maybe shying away when things are not going right, mm. we should be open about these things so that we mm. can learn from them mm. and improve. I agree. I agree. Time is not on our side. <coughs> uh, Re, uh, um, I really enjoy our conversation, but we have to, to wrap things up. I, I want you to give me the, uh, the projection into the future, uh, the next 10 to 20 years. Yes, sir. What can we expect from, you know, brand Taboho, Mahale Mang, and also from Spectrum Analytics? Analytics. Yeah. Yes, sir. So I'm currently enrolled as a DBA, uh, Doctorate of Business Admin student with the Roxburg Institute of Social... you don't want academics. Uh, yes. Uh, they, they <laughs> <laughs> you rejected two doctorates. Yes, sir. But mm. this one, it's a professional doctorate, so uh -huh. I've not been tested on my ability to tell people what they want to hear. Mm. But it's a doctorate where I need to be solving problems, mm. and then I'm recognized for actually solving social problems and creating impact in my community. Mm -hmm. So I set myself a different challenge there mm. to, to get this. It's called a doctorate in what? Uh, business admin. Uh, it's a professional doctorate. So they mm. call it a professional Because you doctorate. already have a master's. Yes, sir. Mm. But uh, for, for Brent Teboho, at the moment, I'm also uh, a board chair, global board chair for the Society of Organizational Learning. Mm. This is a global group of professionals, researchers, um, consultants mm -hmm. who are working on wicked problems. Mm -hmm. And I sit in the global board of this organization. Uh, my aim is to bring this, what we call systems thinking, mm -hmm. which is thinking about relationships between things mm -hmm. and how these relationship dynamics create outcomes that we sometimes complain about. Mm, mm. Yes. So I sit in that board and I'm my aim is to bring systems thinking the way I think into mm. the curriculum. Because a lot of us unfortunately we we think in I would say in static terms in, I guess. in, in mm. linear terms. Mm -hmm. We think in predictable ways, learned habits. We mm. are habitual thinkers. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me it's partly because we, we never see the relationship between our condition and our identities. Mm. And if we could bring that awareness, for me, it could so lead to something better. So what are we going to see in, in, in 20 years' time? 20 years' from time this brand. from this brand, mm. I'll be influencing things around wicked problems, how we could see that AI is just a tool and not the primary thing. Mm. I'm, not I'm more concerned about human intelligence than artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for me, it's about greater impact. Mm. It's about uh, bringing solutions. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're working on a social protection solution uh, funded by BIF. Protection from what? Um, poverty. It okay. could be poverty, it could be any mm. social issue. Funded by? Botswana Innovation Fund. Uh, mm. We 
Remember during COVID when Bom Mabui were going? Yes, yes. Yes. Actually, our solution is called Mabui. Mm. So we register vulnerable people. We register social s- protection service providers. Then we match the people to the best service provider. We've wow. automated all that. Mm. They were also tackling issues around shortage of blood in the country, leveraging emerging technologies and data to say, hey, these are the content you need to be pushing. So mm. I'm already doing it, but mm. it's just to magnify mm. the impact and also to train the next generation as well. Um, we've done very well. Mm. My company, even last year, we took the largest number of interns in the country. Wow. How many? 12. Mm-hmm. And that was the largest. I was surprised when I heard from the school that, yeah. yay, you guys took the largest number. Yeah. I want to take more mm-hmm. yeah because for me students everyone learns better when they're doing projects yeah yeah, yeah. so i get them mm. give them projects and then mentor them to solve these wow. so that's the level of impact i want to magnify mm-hmm. i think i can do this on a grand scale, scale yeah. so i'm learning how i could leverage relationships that i mm-hmm. have with corporate with government to magnify this impact and in 10 years i want to see this being Mm. standard but as for the company (coughs) we want to scale outside our borders but we need to nigeria kenya nigeria kenya we have already registered in south africa Mm -hmm. we're learning about this dynamics of the south african market but we now want to get into the whole of africa and we have someone who's who doesn't even speak Sutwana head in Spectrum Analytics Nigeria? Wow. Spectrum Analytics Kenya. Mm. So that uh, for me, that's those are the opportunities that wow. emerge when we see that for us as Botswana, just like other companies, mm. expand into our market. Mm. We can expand into other markets, market, yeah. especially when we are value driven. Mm. When we understand that business is about creating value and being paid for that. For that value. Yes, sir. Yeah. Wow, this has been quite uplifting and interesting. Do you have a question for me? Yes, sir. I do, I do. Mm. What has sustained you for all these years? Mm. Apart from his grace, it's been just a determination to make a difference, a determination to have impact, uh, whether it means on the employees or on the customers um, want to make a difference and lately I've been defining it in the sense of servant leadership where you want to serve and more and more people in fact the whole idea of being successful and wealthy comes from the extent to which you can serve the biggest numbers so the knowledge uh, that the ability to serve is growing I mean if I build buildings I'm going to serve more tenants. If I open a restaurant, I'm going to save more customers and so on and so forth. That has been the driver and obviously the desire to leave some sort of legacy influenced by our four pillars, which is to infuse, to energize, to inspire and to, um, to, to empower. So if we can achieve those four in anything we do. So on an average day, I ask myself at the end of the day, have I done those four things? And then I can say, no, it's a day well lived if I achieve those things. Ah, mm. So, yes. So, for me, I, I really love that. Mm. And because you're someone who has done it earlier than mm. most of us, if I could get a second question. Mm. like, What is it? For your generation, the entrepreneurship, value-driven entrepreneurship is... Most people were looking into tenders and, and all that. What, what led you down your specific path when you started? Yeah, I think tender, tendering is part of entrepreneurship. For instance, I wouldn't have obtained a plot in the CBD without a tender. Yes. And indeed, if you look at our sanitation business, um, you know, Mama Hobe and her team are always tendering. So working with government... Tendering is, is just a way of getting jobs from government. There's no mystery to it. Yes. So what, what, what I think most people need to accept is that it should not be your only route. There's nothing negative about tendering. 
uh, you need to master tendering. In fact, I have a, um, a couple of nuggets on tendering, on, 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 on uh, Mohobe nuggets of wisdom. Uh, we should not, because um, a lot of entrepreneurs think of tenderpreneurship in negative terms. I think tenderpreneurship is an important part of entrepreneurship that you need to embrace. So, but there's a tendency to just rely in a lopsided fashion on government tenders. That is wrong. I think one should have, a, to use your word, a broader spectrum <laughs> <laughs> in terms of where you are sourcing jobs. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's how I look at it. Thank you. All right. Look at that camera, sir, and leave the viewer with one final uplifting message as we wrap up. All right. Ah, I'm a great believer that as human beings, um, learning and just creativity is something that we are born with naturally. Nobody teaches us how to speak a language. It's not broken into anything. So human intelligence for me is like something that you know machines cannot rob us of. So to the viewers, I would love to say be a continuous learner. You can never say I've learned and hence I'm stopping. So be a continuous learner. We live in an environment where that is dynamically changing all the time, where you need to be improving yourself all the time, where you need to create, to improve your capacity to create the life that you want. And that can never be possible without learning. Because learning in its essence is our ability to get better at creating from our highest aspirations. And I would, if I could leave anyone with anything is also to say, and learning does not depend on your circumstances. It depends on self-application. All of us, we are forever bigger than our setup. And if some of us could have done it from your own lady, from the kettle post, the kettle post like yeah. Remogobe, uh -huh. so can you do it from wherever you are as long as you see that you just need to learn. Thank you. Wonderful message. Uh, please give them all your contacts, all of them without exception. All right. Um, normally... Uh, posting thought-provoking stuff. Uh, sometimes it would annoy you because it would get you to reflect about things maybe that you're uncomfortable with. But I do write uh, about what we spoke about, especially around learning, solving wicked problems on LinkedIn. Uh, you can check me out, Mang, and connect with me. I'll be happy to connect and share what I know and learn from you as well. I'm also on Facebook, uh, there I even write more provocatively because the aim is to get people to reflect. If you can be provoked, then it means there's something there that we can explore together. But for reaching out to me, um, 7327-9063, I'm happy to connect with anyone who has something that they would love us to explore together and, you know, um, forever available. Uh, if you also want to just have a conversation like I did with Ramukhobe, I'll be open to that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. You've been a great, great guest.